coast of New South Wales. My name is Katie Peakin and it's my privilege to lead our ministry here. Thank you for watching. This is a special occasion for us because this week I received permission from our diocese for us to start meeting in person again and a few brave folk are going to meet this Sunday. It's uh, going to be our first physical service since the end of March. So today I'm going to be reflecting on what we've learned from this strange experience that we've been going through. What have we learned from being people who follow Jesus and who are used to being able to gather with other believers pretty much wherever we wanted to, whenever we wanted to, and then suddenly we're not allowed to meet? Even though it is allowed now, we know that it still is a risky thing. And we know from what's happening around the world and what's happening in Melbourne and Sydney at the moment, that this is a long way from being over. We've had some time to prepare, to start adjusting, to start working out how to do things that really matter in a whole new way. So what have we learned about being Christian from this strange experience? What is the essence of Christian fellowship? I wonder what this time has been like for you. Do you have any new insights into faith and into church from COVID-19 and the changes that it has forced on us? I would love to hear your thoughts and to know that you watch today. So please do leave a comment or a message. If you're watching from our YouTube channel, you'll need a YouTube account or a Gmail account and you can leave your comment under the window. If you're watching from our webpage, you'll find a comment button under this window and if you click on that, there's a place to leave a message there. As I said, we're not through this yet and we're going to keep meeting online as well. We're going to keep having the Lord's Supper on Zoom on Saturday afternoons at four o'clock and we're also experimenting with a sort of hybrid service on Sunday mornings, setting up a Zoom meeting so that people at home can see what's happening in the church and join in at the same time. I imagine that it will be a bit dodgy at first, but we'll get the hang of it in the end. If you'd like to join in either of those Zoom services, you'd be very welcome. All the information that you need is on our website. So if you're on YouTube, there's a link under this window that takes you to the right page. If you're already on our website, you will find the information you need up there. Let's launch in. This is a quote from Psalm 100, one of the ancient songs that's recorded in the Bible. It's about 3,000 years old. And it just blows my mind that I can read what people were singing that long ago and I can think the thoughts that they were thinking back then. Psalm 100 says, Enter the Lord's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Well, let's enter God's courts right now. Let's remember his power and his goodness. I hope you'll join in at home. We're going to sing Everlasting God.
Jesus told a story, a parable, about a man who had two sons, and one of the sons was really rude to his dad. He said to him that he wanted his inheritance right now, couldn't wait for dad to topple off his twig. He took the money and wasted the lot, and then things got really tough. He had no money, he was starving, and he had no friends to help him out. Finally, he decided to go home, to apologize, and to beg his dad to take him on as a, a hired worker. So he said to himself, I'll rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But you know, when he got home, his dad rushed to meet him with a big hug. No social distancing there. Jesus told that story to help us understand what God is like and what we are like. God is our father who loves us. And we are like the rude, obnoxious children who take everything that he's given us and often with hardly a word of thanks. When we come to our senses and realize that we've thrown away the best thing we could have, the best life, the best friend, our mighty king, well, then we come back to him and we have our tails between our legs and we say to him, I'm sorry, I'm not worthy to be your child. Is there anything I can do to earn your love again? But God's answer to us is no. Come and be my child again. Come and be loved. Come and be honoured and trusted. All is forgiven. Well, with that in mind, I invite you to come before God now. And we'll admit that you and I both need God's forgiveness. Let's pray this prayer of confession together. God of all mercy, we humbly admit that we need your help. We have wandered from your way. We have sinned in thought, word and deed and have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us, wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of your spirit that we may live the new life to your glory. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. God doesn't take pleasure in people's mistakes and he doesn't want anyone to die. He wants everyone to turn to Christ and receive life from him. It's when we hear God's invitation that we pray for his help. And this is the good news of the Bible. God pardons everyone who humbly repents and truly believes that they are forgiven through Jesus who died for them. If that's you, then know for sure that you have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul says, Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We should give thanks to the Lord for his good. His unfailing love endures forever. So we've got another song to thank God for his mercy. It's called At the Cross and you'll get to see our music team in this next video.
Jeff has prepared a reading from the Bible for us. Before he reads, let's pray that we will hear whatever God wants us to hear today. Heavenly Father, give us wisdom and understanding as we listen to your word. May we know you better, may we love you more, and may we learn to please you in all we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, Jeff, thank you. Today's reading comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 to 25. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God, with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more you, as you see the day is approaching. This is the word of the Lord. When I first heard back in the middle of March that we had to close the church and stop meeting together for several months and maybe longer, I confess that my very first thought was, Phew, I really need a holiday. That thought didn't last very long. The thought that followed was, how do we be the church when we can't do what the church has always done, when we can't gather as the church? It's been an intriguing time, hasn't it? A terrible, tragic time for very many people across the world. An anxious time for people across Australia and locally and a troubling, distressing, traumatic time because of economic and mental health and domestic violence and, and political repercussions. But for us, for the church, I think we've been handed something very valuable and it would be a shame not to grab it with both hands and see what God wants to do with us. I think he's given us the opportunity to find out what the church really is um, and what it really isn't. So I want to look today at what church means in the Bible and, and then think about what these past few months have started to teach us. I mean, church is a huge topic, so this can only be the briefest of skims across some of the issues, but that's okay. Um, I think that what has happened in the past few months is a beginning. Uh, it's not the end of the story. It's something that we need to keep thinking about. Uh, we need to take it on board. We need to talk about it. We need to work with it. You remember Galileo? He was responsible for pointing out to people that they were looking at the solar system from the wrong perspective, that the sun doesn't go around the earth. Rather, the earth travels around the sun. Well, I think it's time for a Galileo-style shift in the way we think about church. 
And I'm guessing some of you may be thinking, oh, Katie, we've just had four and a half months of unexpected. Today, we're looking for familiar, for something comfortable like my old dressing gown, something that reassures us that God is still in control, that up is up and right is right and God is God. Well, I hope you will feel exactly that. Uh, you and I know that the world is never going to be quite the same again. Things have changed, uh, they're still changing. They aren't going to go back to the way they were before, not completely. And that's okay because change is normal. Change, change is life. What I'm finding very reassuring is the realization that God, God's mission hasn't gone off the rails. He's at work in this whole horrible situation, bringing hope and life and love and a future to more and more people. God is good and he hasn't changed. I mean, you and I were surprised by COVID-19, but God knew about it all from the very beginning. His plan is unfolding just as he intended it to. And I think, you know, grabbing the church by the scruff of the neck and giving it a good shaking, giving us this giant interruption when we've had to work out how to be the church in completely new modes, that's all part of his plan. So what does the Bible say about church? Well, firstly, here's what it doesn't say. The word church doesn't mean what a lot of people use it to mean. In the Bible, the word church doesn't ever refer to a building. It never refers to geographic areas like a parish. It doesn't ever mean a denomination, you know, the Anglican Church, the Uniting Church, the Roman Catholic Church. So what does church mean? The word for church in the Bible is ecclesia. It was an everyday Greek word that uh, meant a meeting, a get together, a gathering of people. You might say to someone, I'm calling an ecclesia this evening to discuss this new development proposal. Can you be there? In Acts chapter 19, a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, calls together a group of local businessmen because he wants to convince them that they should run the Christians out of town. The group, the meeting that he called, it is called an ecclesia, a church. But more often, church in the New Testament takes on a specific meaning. The church is the group of people who have been gathered together by God. It's a gathering of people in response to God's call. About 18 months ago, I was invited to a wedding. Uh, the bride and groom sent me a text message first to ask if I was available to go to their wedding that day. And then they sent me an invitation, a formal invitation. Beautiful, lovely, thick card with a ribbon tied around it and elegant writing on it. I went to the wedding and it was packed. There were lots of people there and uh, a lot of them I had never set eyes on before. A few of them I did know. But those people weren't there because of me. They weren't there because they were my kind of people. We were all there because we had been gathered together by the hosts, by the bride and groom and their families. Church is like that. It's a group of people who have been gathered together in response to God's invitation. It's a party that we've been invited to. In fact, Jesus uses that analogy himself. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. That's in Matthew chapter 22. It's very clear from the Bible that gathering people into the church is central to what God was doing when he sent Jesus into the world. Jesus died so that you and I and people from everywhere and every time could become a group, a family, a unity, so that we could become the church. Church, the gathering of people in response to God's invitation, that is what Christianity is all about. 
In fact, church is the natural effect of people being the way God created us to be. How's that? Well, God created people in his own image. And God is, by nature, relational. God is relationship because he is always Father, Son and Holy Spirit in perfect relationship. When we are the people that we are meant to be, we are all about relationship too. So the new commandment that Jesus gave to his followers, to you and me, is love one another the way that I have loved you. And how Jesus loves us is he puts our relationship even above his own life. So what all this boils down to is that it is a contradiction in terms for someone to say that they're Christian but that they don't want anything to do with the church. It just isn't possible. You can't be connected with Jesus, the head of the church, and not be connected with his body, the church. It's like the dancer who's invited to join the, the Australian ballet, but they refuse to dance with the rest of the corps. Or the NRL player who is invited to join the, the blues, but he'll only play when no one else is there. Now, before COVID-19, if someone asked me, what does it look like to be part of the church? Well, I probably would have said it looks like giving up your precious family time on Sunday morning or your sleep-in time, as the case may be, or maybe it's a, your church meets on a Saturday, so you give up going to the pub with your friends or whatever it might be, and you gather with other Christians. And you do that on a regular basis, weekly, maybe even more. That's what the passage in Hebrews that we just heard says, isn't it? It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Wait up. Does that mean that if we can't meet, the church doesn't exist? That it's gone, that's it, no more church? Well, no, not at all. In fact, history has shown that when the church can't meet, often that's when it grows the most strongly. That happened in China, it happened in Russia too, when their governments refused to allow them to meet. And COVID-19 has just given us our own proof that the church isn't just the group of people that meets at a certain place at a certain time. And have a look at that reading that we had from Hebrews chapter 10. It says there, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. The point of the exercise is not the meeting. The point of the exercise is encouraging one another. That whole sentence says, starting back before it, uh, in verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. That's the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. A time is coming when we will all face Jesus and he will judge us. On that day, we need to have our trust in him. We need to be relying only on his death for us. If we've given up our faith, if we've stopped believing that God loves us and forgives us, if we've gone looking somewhere else for the meaning of life, if we've gone looking somewhere else for our standard of what's right and wrong, well, then we're lost. We are to keep meeting together, not for the sake of meeting, but for the sake of encouraging one another towards love and good deeds. Now, I'm pretty sure that you can think of times when people were very diligent about attending church, about meeting together. And they may have looked like pillars of the church, but they didn't encourage other Christians to love. They encouraged them to criticize their brothers and sisters in Christ. They encouraged them to put other people down, treat them as less, less valuable, less worthy. And they didn't encourage other Christians to do good things, good deeds, to grow the fruit of God's spirit, 
they encouraged them instead to be less generous, less kind, less self-controlled, less patient, less forgiving. The meeting was happening, but it wasn't the church. But over these last few months, when we haven't been able to meet, I have seen and heard of members of our church walking around the street, delivering the news sheet and stopping and chatting with each person to encourage them in their faith. I've heard of people making a point of ringing people that they were concerned about, not just once, but regularly, to encourage a brother or sister to keep trusting Jesus. I've heard of people visiting and standing outside the fence to be safe, but checking that someone was okay. I've had people arrive on my doorstep with um, some slice or a piece of pie or some fresh fish, and that encouraged me to think of ways that I could be thoughtful and generous to someone else. I was encouraged towards love and good deeds when I saw what my brothers and sisters in Christ were doing. I've heard of people putting themselves out to be kind to someone who was stuck here. They didn't get out of Australia quickly enough before the shutdown. I've heard of people giving away their second, their only second roll of toilet paper when there were none to be had on the shelves of the supermarket. I've heard of people organising birthday celebrations online for people who were in solitary isolation. I've heard of people shopping for neighbours who were, were particularly vulnerable. I've heard of people with tech skills going to visit somebody to show them how they can Zoom or use FaceTime to connect with their grandchildren. No meetings, no church services, but the church in action church in practice, church doing what Jesus has called us to do in the ways that were possible for us at the time. Loving one another, encouraging one another, helping each other to hang in there. Well, later in this same chapter in Hebrews, it says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. What the church is meant to do is make sure that all of her members hang in there until Jesus returns or takes us home, whichever comes first. It doesn't matter how we do that. It matters that we do that. If we can't meet in a building, well then let's ring, let's text, let's Skype, let's send smoke signals, but let's love each other the way Jesus loves us by giving up whatever we need to give up so that the other person gets a chance to receive what God has promised. That's not all that Jesus has called the church to do, is it? We've been studying 1 Peter during these months of not meeting together. And uh, we've read there that Jesus has created out of this mot motley assortment of people, he has created a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession so that we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You know, my, my friend, the bride, didn't invite me to her wedding to do nothing. She didn't invite me for no purpose. She invited me to come and celebrate her wedding. There was a reason. Jesus didn't invite us into his kingdom for no purpose. He didn't die for us for no reason. There is a plan. The plan is that we will declare his praises. That's it's wonderful religious language. What does it mean? It means he wants us to talk about how good and great and powerful and loving and kind he is. That's how you declare his praises. We are to tell people about Jesus. And why is that? Well, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, puts it as clearly as it can be. Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
We are to be evangelists. That means we are people who speak the message, the good news. And of course, it's tempting to think, oh, that's not my strong point. I'm going to leave that to the minister. But remember, Jesus is talking to the church, the people who belong to him. The minister is not the church. The people are the church. He calls you. He chose you. He doesn't make mistakes. And he expects all his people to declare his praises. Each person has their own way. Maybe when you're listening to your neighbour and they're telling you about something that's gone wrong, maybe your way of declaring Jesus' praises will be to say, do you mind if I pray for you about that? Jesus is powerful. He loves you. Maybe if your nephew asks some interesting questions about life, perhaps you might decide to buy him a Bible, something that's written specifically for youth. Maybe you'll be praying for your next door neighbours, praying for an opportunity to invite them around for dinner, praying for a conversation where you can talk about faith and find out what they think. Maybe you might invite some friends to watch a movie with you and you'll watch it ahead of time so you can make note of um, if there are any Christian themes in it like forgiveness or hope or faithfulness that you might be able to chat about after the movie. Well, three things that I hope you'll take home with you today. First of all, the changes that have happened to the church over these past months, they're not bad news, they're not a disaster. They're an opportunity to ask the question, what is it about church that really matters? How can we keep being the church if we get locked down again, or if our gatherings are restricted to 10, or if some other change is imposed on us, either by this virus or by some other situation? Jesus' spirit is in us. We are connected to him and we are connected to each other through him. We don't stop being the church just because a particular building or a particular style of meeting is out of bounds for us. Secondly, the church is functioning the way she's meant to be functioning when the members are encouraging each other. Encouraging each other to stay faithful, encouraging each other to love and good works. And it is functioning the way it's meant to function when we love each other enough to care whether each other is going to be there in God's eternity. When we love each other enough that we're prepared to give up even our life so that someone else has the opportunity to live forever. No matter how big or spectacular or meaningful or polished our services are, the church is sick. The church is dying when the members discourage each other, when they tempt and urge each other towards being mean-spirited and hurtful. A church like that would be much better shut down permanently rather than spreading that poison any further. I love John Dixon's analogy. He says, going to church does not make you a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage makes you a car. Going to church does not mean that we are being the church. Let's work on being Christian, being the church, rather than on going to church. And finally, third thing, the church isn't really the church unless the members are declaring Jesus' praises. We're meant to tell people not, not just how much comfort Jesus gives us from day to day, but how he has brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's how Peter puts it. We're meant to tell people that Jesus has gone ahead of us into the throne room of God the Father so that we can go too. We can enter into heaven and meet with God. We're meant to tell them that all people fall short of God's perfect standard of goodness, but that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who speaks to the Father in our defence. And our advocate is the same person who died for us the perfect sacrifice who paid for our sins and also for the sins of the whole world. So let's have a look around us and see that the time is short. This virus may make it shorter for someone we know. 
So what does that person need more than anything? They need to know the love of God. They need the promise of eternal life. Let's start being the church, encouraging each other to persevere, encouraging each other to love and good deeds, and let's be praying and planning and strategizing and taking leaps of faith, praying for people to meet Jesus. We have no way of knowing what the church is meant to be except by soaking in what Jesus says about the church. In fact, we don't even know who we are or what it means to be truly human except by watching Jesus, the perfect human. Jesus says listening to him is like building our house on the rock. In times like these when the things we thought we could rely on have been swept rudely away, well, the only thing we can rely on is Jesus. We're going to sing about that right now. This is the latest offering from our music team. I hope you'll enjoy it. Live on the rock. Paul says, pray in the spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, he says, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. Well, Bev's going to lead us now in our family prayers. Thanks, Bev. My name is Bev Love. Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Heavenly Father, as Christians, we turn to you in times of fear and uncertainty, as we do in times of joy and celebration. Please join us as we pray for God's heart of love, mercy and truth to dwell in us and show us how to face the challenges posed by the coronavirus. Almighty God, we know that everything is in your sovereign control. You made the world and care for all creation. 
but the world feels strange and different right now. The news and TV bombards us with stories of ill and death. Some people are worried about getting ill, others are anxious for their family and friends. Be with them, Lord, and help them to find peace. For Timothy 2, verses 1 and 7 say, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We pray for doctors and nurses and scientists and all who are working to discover the right medicines to help those who are ill. Thank you that even in these anxious times you are still with us. Help us to put our trust in you to keep us safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Father God, you are our refuge and stronghold and we pray for the health and well-being of our nation. We are still the great south land of the Holy Spirit with the advantage of being an island nation. We give thanks for our Christian, compassionate leader, Scott Morrison, who seeks to serve the common good, and we pray for all state premiers. Give them wise counsel that they may lead our country and communities to respond to this crisis with calm and generosity. Assist them to govern for the good of all society as a whole, as the economy of our country and the world changes. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for all the services that have been implemented to protect us. May we have a spirit of acceptance as we try to find some normality in our daily lives. Enable our leaders to properly resource and support police, ambulance and fire services in such a way that our communities maintain peace and safety. God of justice, we pray for the poor for the unemployed and all those who are to be laid off, the economically vulnerable and for those with, without or with low resources at this time. Lord, it is too much for some to bear. Provide for them in their need, Lord, and lead us as agents to share in generosity and help with our ability. For any that seek to exploit and gain at the expenses of others, Frustrate their efforts, Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a God of all compassion and comfort and we thank you that you listen to our prayers. We pray today for our church as we seek to get back to gathering in worship. Enable us to walk by faith. Help us to be patient, careful and wise in taking whatever precautions are necessary to limit and contain the spread of this virus. Strengthen us to remain calm and responsible while seeking the welfare of others above ourselves. At times of uncertainty and anxiety, help us to look to security in your Son, Jesus Christ, and give courage to Christians as we point others to the one in whom there is always hope. We thank you, Jesus, that you have enabled us to learn new ways to worship and meet together in what for some have been very spiritual experiences. Maybe some of us may choose not to go back to in-person services, having experienced many emotions around COVID-19. We pray for unity and understanding when divisions arise, as we know prayer leads to peace. Praise and blessings to Katie for ministering to us during this depressing time. She has had to make new challenges and has brought a lot of us oldies into the 21st century. Uplift her, Father, and give her energy and strength and surround her with your love as we hopefully get to a reopening of our church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you are our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. We pray for ourselves and our community. Loving Father, we thank you that our community has always been rather isolated from large crowds and we are used to a quiet life. Be present now, Lord, to those who need your loving touch because they are isolated due to COVID-19. May they feel your power of healing through the care of doctors and nurses. 
Lord, we lift to you all of those amongst us to whom we know are in lockdown, the elderly and those with chronic health conditions, unable to have visitors from loved ones for months. Be their comfort, Lord, in this time of uncertainty and loneliness. We bring to you, Lord Jesus, those who still mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray you will comfort them and surround them with your loving arms. We pray for those of us who have family members working in high-risk areas of infection, doctors, nurses and caregivers. Bring your protection upon them as they work with patients. Multiply their supplies so that they have the, protection, the protective items needed to stay safe on the job. And we ask all these things for this country and these people in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, Paul encourages us to pray about all sorts of things. Right after that, he says, Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Well, I'm going to pray now for God's message to go out to all people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, mighty Lord and Saviour, we know that your dearest desire is for people to come to know you and to receive your love, your forgiveness, your eternal life. Father, for everyone who is worried about COVID-19, we have the words of eternal life. We have the antidote to death. Father, we pray now for the people we know who are on the front line sharing the message of Jesus with people who haven't heard it or haven't yet understood and believed it. As Paul said, please give them the right words so that whoever they speak to comes to understand the amazing news that they're invited to be friends with the God of the universe. And for us too, Lord, make us ready and willing to chat with people about Jesus. You've called each one of us to be priests whose job is to make you known to the world Please, God, fill us so full of confidence and joy in Jesus and the wonderful future that you've promised us that we can't help it spilling out in our conversations. Well, let's take 10 minutes now and name to God the friends, the family, the co-workers, the neighbours that we long to see put their faith in Jesus. Lord, we ask you to reveal yourself to these dear people so that they may receive the precious gift you have already given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've almost come to the end of our time together, so I'm going to pray. Maybe you'd like to join in the second part of this prayer. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your spirit that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you through Jesus Christ our Lord amen will you join in with me Lord Jesus Christ send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name amen
bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Well, thank you again for watching. I pray that you and the people you love will be safe and that this week ahead will be full of good things for you. Don't forget to leave me your thoughts about church and about faith, any insights you've had during this COVID-19 strangeness underneath the window. See you next week. Bye.